when I was born in 1970, Kolkata was India's largest city. It was the not only the cultural hub, it was also the economic hub. Uh, Kolkata did not die. It was murdered. And I'm a witness of that murder. It's not just a case of uh, poor management or not understanding. This was done with a clear uh, targeted demolition of a entire way of life. Specifically, I will name Chief Minister Jyoti Basu, who was responsible for this. Our history is unfortunately an accumulation of colonial biases, Nehruvian biases, and now Marxist biases. Why is it that Indians really propagate this sort of uh, foreign understanding of what India is? This collaborationist class actually is the biggest beneficiary of independence. So what happens is the British leave and these guys all get promoted up. The same person who was ordering troops to fire against the uh, freedom fighters uh, during their the, own people uh, and their own people are the same people who uh, a few years later after independence become the senior officials and are now uh, administering. administering the country. They know that if, if, you, if India had existed from the beginning of time till now, then they were traitors before 1947. Economies cannot be made to thrive with five-year plans, which are prescriptive and they say, you know, this is exactly what will happen, etc. It doesn't allow for innovation and adaptation and moving forward. I think what we need to do is to really begin to look at uh, economics not as a siloed field, where economics is all about finding some random data set, putting it on some chart, doing running some regression on it, and then making grand claims about the world based on some obscure data set. It is totally useless not replicable and has no ability to inform policy. Economics has got to have a much more freewheeling, wider view of what the field of economics should be. this special episode of Podcast with Ananya, where we are honoured to host Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal, a renowned economist and member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. Mr. Sanyal is known for a wide spectrum of knowledge and experience spanning domains like economics, history, geography, urban planning, finance, sustainable development. So as you can imagine, it's needed a lot of homework for me to prepare questions for this particular session. But that's probably the beauty of this exercise, to learn about how the world works but through the lens of subject matter experts. Thank you so much, Mr. Sanyal, for joining us with podcast uh, with Ananya uh, today. So while we made a formal introduction to you as the member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, uh, but have you been told that you're also a polymath, given your wide spectrum of knowledge, whether it's history, geopolitics, economy, finance, banking, whatnot? Have you been told that? Well, I mean, it depends what you mean by a polymath. <laughs> uh, yeah, I suppose, uh, you know, a polymath is somebody who, who is interested in different fields. And I am dif in, in, in interested in different fields. Um, and, you know, the, the fact that there are so many, uh, so many different uh, facets to uh, a lot of my research uh, comes from a strong belief that I have is that while we divide up the world into these silos, uh, for academic pedagogical reasons. The real world does not function in any silos. Um, history affects geography, geography affects history, it affects um, um, geography affects uh, economics, economics affects politics, politics affects history, and back and forth in multiple different ways. So as I have said before, it is the interlinkages between all of this. Mm -hmm. That is the really interesting part of what happens, not in any one of these silos. And by the way, there is a formal way of thinking about this. It's called complexity theory, which I, uh, which I, you know, I have repeatedly said is the intellectual framework that I widely use. Right. So, talking of complexity theory, um, how do you really apply it in practice? Say within the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, could you give us some examples of how do you use that lens when you look at a problem? So let me explain what complexity theory is in the first place. Right. See. People do not realize that whether whether you're doing economics or doing science, much of this is ultimately based on a framework of philosophy that you're using. So the philosophical framework that I use is called complex complexity theory, which is itself derived from 
uh, chaos theory. Uh, now, what happens here? What happens here is that there, this is an idea of the world where there are a large number of moving parts. These moving parts are interacting, but not necessarily like in a machine where uh, you know each piece is doing clearly predictable things. Okay. These are interacting in all kinds of semi-independent um, ways and unpredictable ways. So the world then becomes a non-deterministic system, i.e. Okay. the way the world actually flows out is not clearly predicted. Okay. Now, this doesn't mean it is random. Okay. There are certain patterns. There are certain areas where, you know, in a localized way, there may be a clear uh, 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 determinism of some sort. But the overall system is chaotic, so to speak. Mm. Now, there are many things that function in this way that I described. Yeah. Um, climactic systems function in this way. Um, economies and financial markets function in this way. Languages like English mm. function in this way. Uh, the, the the Hindu religion functions that way. Um, so what is happening? These are complex adaptive systems that are that have certain components. There are there is certain grammar to it. So it's not random. It has some laws. There are some. I wouldn't use the word laws in a strict way, but there are certain relationships mm. that are indeed stable. There are certain um, nodes which are called strange attractors around which. Um, things may swirl. So there are some organizing principles. And yes, there are also certain laws. But what happens in these systems is that the way the functioning of the overall system works is not linear. So you can have butterfly effects, for example. You have a small impact, a small uh, shock to the system with very large impact, and a very large shock to the system which has a very small impact. You have unintended consequences. You have... Uh, utterly uh, unpredictable interactions which you hadn't could not possibly have imagined. Uh, imagined. Yeah. So this is much more uh, a much more uh, um, complex and chaotic, but it's also adapting. Yeah. So it is a system that where um, the path it's path dependent in that the path through which it has gone it carries its history along with it. Yeah. So let me contrast it yeah. with say a Newtonian system, yeah. which is completely deterministic. If you take a football and you kick it in a particular, with a certain amount of force, it will behave in an exactly same kind of way. Um, similarly, it has no sense of its history. A football, uh, if you, it does, does not care what you did with it previously. Right. If you take the football uh, then and, and then kick it, um, it will behave in exactly the same way, irrespective of what its history was. Right. So this is therefore a different way of thinking about the world. Right. Say a city, for example, is a complex adaptive system. Mm -hmm. So there are many things going on. The buildings are there. There are institutions there. There are people there. There are, there are merchants. There are temples. There are mosques. There are offices. All of these things are interacting in all kinds of unpredictable ways. Then technologies come along. These cities have adapt. They change. It is not possible to predict how, say, for example, Delhi will be in 100 years' time. Mm -hmm. When New Delhi was being built 100 years back, they had no way of judging that this was going to become a 24 or 25 million uh, population uh, mega city. So these are adaptive systems and complex adaptive system framework is a way of thinking about such systems. Right. You spoke about cities and uh, at very many places you've spoken about how we might need to move away from a top-down approach to a more bottom-up approach in terms of thinking about city planning. Can you explain A, what does that mean? B, are there any examples from Indian cities which you think have flourished in a bottom-up manner and that might be the way to go? So this is this comes from the same thinking process about complex adaptive systems. Mm. For exactly the same reason that economies cannot be made to thrive with five-year plans, which are prescriptive and they say, you know, this is exactly what will happen, etc. What happens? You create a license permit raj. Mm. Now, license permit raj did not work for the economy. Why? it doesn't allow for innovation and adaptation and moving forward. Mm. It's entirely dependent on some bureaucrat being able to issue the license or people in the planning commission, wise people sitting in the planning commission knowing where the world will go. As it turns out, they have no idea where the world is going. And so they, would, they, they continuously get it wrong. Yeah. So this exact same logic is still alive mm. in urban planning. So we dumped it from 
economic management hmm. unfortunately we still run our cities as if the soviet union is alive and well and instead of calling the five year plans we call them the master plan hmm. if you go and look at the master plan or you look at our building codes it's extraordinary how prescriptive they are they'll tell you how big your prayer room should be it'll tell you how big the window should be why i want to build windows how i wish i understand that there are certain rules that need to be there for fire safety or structural safety but why do you need to know how big my uh, prayer hall is or how big my kitchen should be or uh, whether i want five staircases in my house or that's my problem all you need is the external facade should be a certain kind mm. uh, that i understand you may want to maintain some order in that certain regulations yeah. there but why do you care what happens inside my house so this whole approach of master planning means that what happens our cities are fundamentally dysfunctional right from day one and it doesn't allow for any innovation mm. so let let me show you how what has happened as a result go and look at indian cities from before independence oh, it could be colonial era cities or even earlier harappan pre- cities pre colonial mm. cities pre colonial cities that have exist today mm. and what will strike you is that different parts of india have different kinds of uh urban outcomes so uh, jaipur looks very different from uh, cities in the northeast which look very different from cities uh, 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 in south india and so on and so forth which is exactly what you should expect different climates different cultural contexts uh, different economic uses should lead to different uh, um, um urban outcomes right but you look at cities built after independence and they all have this pwd construction layouts mm. and these box like houses why because you're forced to do it mm. by these building codes okay. if i tried to build the taj mahal today mm. the municipality of agra would not allow me they would find that it doesn't comply with any of the building codes so what happens is that you lead to this drab ugliness and the only way that you'll get some exceptions to this is that uh, you know some um, uh, some corporate or something basically builds uh, um, gets an exemption or simply ignores the laws and builds something interesting and that's what basically what's happened in gurgaon mm. is that the somewhat more modern and different buildings you get in gurgaon are essentially all in violation of these norms and they get built uh, I'm, i'm sure they regularize them afterwards so it's only in very recent times the last few years we have finally begun to build buildings that are something outside of these set norms the set norms um the new parliament for example is an example where we have built something finally for the first time since independence a building that is uh, you know uh, something to look at otherwise what we were building we were building shastri bhavan and nirban bhavan why are we building shastri bhavan and nirban bhavan right. it's not a technological problem after all the british were able to build Um, uh, beautiful buildings in in 1920s right right we were able to build taj mahal and hawa mahal and all these other mahals right. so why can't we build them today why are we building nirman bhavan right right because of these codes and it comes from this problem of having these rigid mindset and the same thing is being replicated on the ground with these ugly cities right. for example dwarka area in delhi right, right? extremely rigidly planned and utter ugliness everywhere why the building codes actually force you to build those ugly buildings mm. and i think it's also a question that not very many people understand uh, that these codes i mean they take it for granted and probably don't even question why do we have codes uh, such codes yes in, in fact we, there is this understanding that these codes actually are modern and actually uh, lead to uh, better uh, uh, outcomes they don't they are in 1950s view of architecture derived from a fa- fascist architect called le corbusier who is held in high esteem only in india nowhere else in the world yeah. he codified this extremely ugly architecture and we have perpetuated it uh, uh, for for this last 60 70 years right right um uh, talking of cities uh, we know about the smart city uh, mission what is the smart piece in the smart city uh, mission because people tend to conflate it with the digital infrastructure is it that or is it more and what is it no it's nothing to do with digital infrastructure okay so unfortunately the word smart has been 
captured by smartphones. Ah, right. So therefore, uh, but you know, when this thing, but that word means many things. But the smartness of a city or urban design really comes from your ability to deal with the adaptive, complex nature of a city. Hmm. So that is really what the smartness is about. And if you look at the Smart Cities project, you will see very clearly that the interventions are of all kinds of different things. And it is about essentially the smartness comes from picking urban into directed urban interventions rather than trying to sort of rigidly trying to change the whole thing. Mm. It comes from the smartness part comes from taking directed interventions that can have large disproportionate and non-linear impact on the running of the city. Right. So I'll give you uh, examples of this. Uh, even before the Smart City project came in, uh, you had in Ahmedabad, the Sabarmati Riverfront, the Kakadia Lake development. Now that completely changed the nature of the city. Hmm. They were directed interventions and that changes. So the same thing is happening with Smart City. Like for example, you take Coimbatore. It used to have, it, it has from ancient times, this network of lakes. Now, these lakes were basically over time become dumps. They were full of rubbish uh, and they were eyesore. As part of the smart cities effort, they've been cleaned up. They were interconnected again. They're providing better drainage. But importantly, they have now become great places for leisure. Yeah. Similarly, in Surat, there is an old fort that is getting upgraded and becoming a centerpiece of urban activities there. Uh, in Indore, there is a food street that has got pedestrianized. It's called, I think, Chappan, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And so, so it's now become the center of uh, nightlife mm. in Indore. Mm. So not only, so you make these very targeted interventions. Which may be contextual to the local the, to, to absolutely. cities. Absolutely. So the whole point about complexity theory is that uns, the, the solutions are contextual. Right, right. And given India's diversity, probably absolutely. that's the only way to go. Absolutely. Right. No, even in a city, it should be contextual. The point is, you can clearly see how this is very different from the five-year plan, Mahalan Obis kind of worldview, hmm. right? Which is about that here is the grand plan. Their and, perfect view of... And uh, yeah, wise people sitting in the... Uh, uh, and they're always, always men. So they're wise men sitting in the planning commission will tell you how you should run the world. It is that you have therefore this bottom-up approach and you allow for all kinds of experimentation. Some, not all of them will work, but that's fine. Right. That's what adaptation is about. Right. Uh, since you mentioned, uh, you know, the socialist view of economy or planning, um, in some of your interviews, you've spoken about how growing up in Kolkata, uh, when there was a Communist Party rule in West Bengal. And then, of course, you did your undergrad in Delhi uh, at a time when USSR was coming down and things were changing. That was early 90s. And you've said how that shaped your thinking about socialism. My question is, how did those early impressions impact the way you think about economy and markets by themselves? So, as I said, whether it's the economy or my thinking on cities or my thinking on history, uh, some part or a large part of it is uh, driven by my own experience of growing up in 1970s, 1980s mm. Kolkata. Mm. And essentially what happened is that when I was born in 1970, Kolkata was India's largest city. It was the not only the cultural hub, it was also the economic hub. People mm. forget this, that the economic hub around Kolkata mm. uh, in 1970 was the largest in the country. In fact, uh, at that time, uh, other than Japan, mm. this was the largest industrial cluster in Asia. Wow. Okay. It was more important economically than even Mumbai, mm. which later became the financial hub. So in my lifetime, Kolkata went from being this great intellectual, cultural, economic, industrial hub. Mm. By the time I was 20, it was already irrelevant. So I essentially am uh, a witness of what happened. In fact, as I keep saying, uh, Kolkata did not die. It was murdered. And I'm a witness of that murder. Mm. And under the communists, you had systematic demolition of the economic and intellectual underpinnings of Kolkata by the communists. And as I said, I witnessed it myself. Right. It was done thoroughly and systematically. It's not just a case of 
poor management or not understanding this was done with a clear uh, targeted demolition of a entire way of life mm. and as i said that led to my uh, uh, this view of much in much sharper contrast than maybe other indians mm. who of course grew up in a socialist india and consequently maybe also aware of uh, the uh, drawbacks of the license permit raj yeah. but in kolkata i saw it in much sharper con- contrast right uh, not just the failures economically but the enormous violence of it whether it's morijhapi massacre or the various other uh, communist led massacres that happened in the 80s mm. okay so the enormous violence that came with it and the demolition of the economic and cultural and intellectual um, uh, clustering of kolkata uh, which was uh, deliberately uh, broken down uh, specifically i will name Ch- chief minister jyoti basu who was responsible for this okay um your one of your early interests is uh, history um and with many books out there um especially the book on the incredible history of uh, indian ocean and some of it you also talk about in the land of seven rivers which is india's much neglected maritime history and you've been responsible for literally bringing that back uh you know to the center stage um do you think there are any practical lessons that we can pick up from india's maritime history that can be applied to the current state of geopolitics and economics because geography remains the same so it's very important that we have a maritime view of ourselves hmm. um india is the only country which has an ocean named after it the indian ocean a lot of our history our past is linked to the oceans large part of our population lives along the coastline uh all from gujarat down to south india and up the other coast through orissa to bengal it's coastal uh, uh, history and yet our mind space is very landlocked yes now why is this the case i don't know perhaps because our capital is delhi and it's a landlocked place i i don't know the, the reason for it mm. but i'm just telling you that it is the case that when we think of our neighbors for example we think of china and we think of um uh, pakistan therefore our neighborhood looks all very dangerous and bad but in fact if you take a maritime view of things we have other neighbors uh, we have neighbors like singapore or indonesia or australia or the uae and oman all of these are friendly countries right right we have very good relations with them and this is not a new thing um the country of indonesia is named after india its national symbol is the garuda vishnu's Ga- vishnu's garuda its currency is called the rupiah mm. there's a country called singapore singapura it literally means the lion city right. just like jaipur udaipur singapore mm. so clearly there is very close cultural and uh, uh, emotional link to these places and these places celebrate it mm. it is we Uh, who seem to not care about this similarly you look at the middle east uh, till the 1960s the indian rupee was the currency used in most of these countries and the the, the stopping of that is partly because of the indians withdrew uh, from the middle east um that is you know we we made it difficult for in the 1960s for these countries to use the indian rupee mm. and so that is when many of these countries introduced their own currencies so you know it is extraordinary that we indians do not seem to value these relationships these countries actually value these relationships more than we do and we have got caught in this landlocked view which thankfully in very recent years maybe because we have a chief minister from a coastal state like gujarat that we are finally exploring so you know in very recent times we have begun you know the relationship for example with the middle east has dramatically improved the uae for example we now have this mutual relationship about the use of the rupee yes. uh, p- uh, and the payment system going back to how it was yeah, probably yeah going back to, in some ways to how it was yes. uh, not entirely in the same way but nonetheless i'm just pointing out to you that these countries are far more open to us than we have been to them and yet we have a 5000 year history of trade with the middle east mm. right we have thousands of years of uh, um, trading relationship cultural relationship in indonesia cambodia vietnam you mentioned these countries and we have uh, we don't seem to cherish it so having a more maritime view of the world 
has enormous uh, benefits and i am not even getting into places which have large indian uh, diasporas like mauritius mm. and south africa and so on right right maybe that goes back to that original problem of a few men sitting in delhi thinking of you know that that statist view probably that yes maybe that is the problem that you know once you have this top down view yeah. then you get dominated by the views of where those people are yes and where they're and talking so from and so since uh, we are sitting in fact in what used to be the old planning commission building and um, you know that status top down view is then limited by the imagination of the uh, those so called wise men sitting in this building right right uh, moving on to the next question about your latest book on revolutionaries um where do you come in the debate around retelling indian history and how do you really answer or address this narrative where people you know also uh maybe from the left uh ecosystem talk about how history is sort of being rewritten or changed uh whereas you talk about writing a more holistic objective version of the history so th- there there is no doubt in my mind mm-hmm. that there has to be a um, you know a, a, a retelling of our indian history and uh, that should come as no surprise because <laughs> i have been one of its prime uh, advocates of this line of thought So the question is what am i advocating i am not advocating that you replace one set of lies with another set of lies mm. all i'm saying is that look our history is unfortunately an accumulation of colonial biases mm. nehruvian biases and now marxist biases mm. and this accumulation of biases has meant that our history no longer makes any sense mm. and it doesn't even correlate with the primary evidence the primary sources yes the primary sources in, in the end everybody is allowed to have their own opinions they are not allowed their own evidence mm. so go back and look at the evidence and see what makes sense and you will see that some of the things i'm digging up this thing about maritime history is one of them but also i mean the my new book on revolutionaries what does it do it basically goes and retells the story of india's freedom struggle from the perspective of those who put up an armed uh, resistance to the british they have been just edited out of the story and the story has been written in uh, in the official line of our freedom struggle is now suggests that you know that it was uniquely uh, nonviolent that we uh, you know gently suggested to uh, the british that they leave and they very politely after having completed their civilizing mission they left mm. uh, that is not the case right right do you think this retelling of indian history is limited to modern indian history and the freedom struggle or no the entire gamut of history right from the beginning i mean there is no evidence of something called an aryan invasion there just isn't now there are various kinds of ways of you know they of trying to retain it but this is garbage there is no genetic evidence there's no archaeological evidence there's no textual evidence the vedas clearly do not mention any knowledge of anything outside of northwestern india hmm. right they don't seem to have any knowledge of central asia there is no mention of anything i mean there are clear mention of geography which relates to haryana western up eastern punjab northern rajasthan that is the zone hmm. that the vedas talk about and there is clearly no knowledge of central asia how can these people be suddenly called to be invaders from somewhere else mm. i mean this is utter garbage so this is why the entire history of india now needs to be rethought mm. now why is it that we ended up here because we became in some ways a victim of the europeans needing a history uh, uh, for themselves particularly the germans and you see what happens in the 19th century <clears throat> is that there is a breakdown of the old history that comes with garden of eden and all this kind of uh, uh, line of thought mm. and so now what happens is that since this sort of uh, darwinian view of history pops up and it gives the impression that consequently you, it, this is about uh, you know a superior part of the species always dominating the inferior parts of the species mm-hmm. so ironically mm-hmm. the darwinian social darwinism mm-hmm. provides a uh, intellectual framework for racism right so then what happens is therefore it then gets converted 
in uh, combined with this idea of civilizing mission of the europeans mm. into this idea that there has always been these superior civilizations capturing inferior civilizations and civilizing them or eliminating them so this becomes by the way as you know in europe it ultimately culminates in nazism yeah. but the softer versions of them mm. are embedded into all the colonial histories so therefore the idea then is um the white population of europe is seen to be going to the rest of the world and civilizing them because they are the superior race so to speak yeah. so when they go to other places like for example australia um this you know it's a natural darwinianism that the white people come and the local aborigines get wiped out because they are uncivilized and so on right. now coming to india however there is a problem huh. because they are clearly a bunch of people who are quite sophisticated have been around for a long time and for a long period of time had a civilization that was superior in every way to that which existed in say the british isles right. or in northern europe yeah. so how do they account for this so the way they account for it is by doing something very simple they say that look this civilization you are proud of about well it is not your civilization it was given to you by these white people who came from outside uh, called the aryans right who are they say the, the they, caucasians who yeah the caucasians so we white people came and gave you the civilization and by the way today we are conquered you and we are just giving you a software update <laughs> right yeah so it also justifies their subsequent uh, conquest conquest. Of, conquest of india so this is the reason they are doing this hmm. now i understand why they were by the way by why they were doing this and they did this everywhere they went it's not that they are only doing this in india they are, they have a similar story when they conquer africa as well it's called the hemetic invasion theory where white people from the mediterranean they go down to africa and they conquer various places and so when for example you find a ancient city in zimbabwe like great zimbabwe mm. they say see it can't be the locals who built it it must have been white people from the north who came and built it so every evidence of past civilization is somehow interpreted as white people must have come from somewhere in the past and given it to you Okay. Okay. It's not just done in India. It's yeah. done everywhere. The systematic. Uh, It's systematic. Yeah. Now, the bizarre thing is that in everywhere else, they understood this and have evicted it out of their storyline. And reclaim their. And own reclaim history. their own story. Zimbabwe, you go and ask them, will the hemetic invasion theory? They laugh at you. Hmm. Right. Right. Zimbabwe, the country is now named after the place Zimbabwe. Hmm. Right. Right. They have reclaimed their history. similar kinds of things were done in other parts of the world they've all trashed it it's in india alone that there is this great pride in trying to re retain these uh, bizarre racial theories mm. and by the way they're all linked to each other in various ways people don't realize this this all this with a conversation okay. many of the same people are involved in this yeah. so there is a statistician called mahananobis he was involved in creating these five year plans mm. that i am railing against Do you know how he originally made his name? Mm. Mahalanobis was actually a part of a racial movement, and much of his statistics was originally derived actually to measure the skulls of human beings in India. Okay. In order to prove some bizarre racial theories using the height of the nose and the size of the skull, etc., to to essentially show how much of Indians are how Aryan. Okay 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 this is a that's his background that's his background yeah now this guy who derived derived all these statistical tools for these bizarre eugenics programs mm. for the british because he basically was trying to cozy up to them in some fashion to prove uh, these these uh, racial theories after independence is given even though he has no no background in uh, economics He is the one who is given the job of actually managing the Indian economy. Wow. You can see how these things are related. So I have a follow-up question on what you just explained. Uh, whether it's in the media, whether it's in political parties, whether it's in say colleges, institutions, why is it that Indians really, after so many years of independence, really propagate this sort of uh, foreign understanding of what india is uh, why is it still propagated i mean even some may say they are funded or not funded but why is it that we really feel that that is what the objective truth is well because you have to understand who the intellectuals of post independence india were hmm. they were not those who fought for independence to the large extent so what happens at independence is the following is that 
one branch of those who fought for independence, mm. the Nehruvians, right. they capture power. Mm. And they're very keen, having captured power, that other branches of those who had fought for independence are kept out of uh, the limelight. Mm. Hence, for example, the revolutionaries are pushed out of the limelight. Of course, the revolutionaries had their own problems because much of their top leadership had been killed or disappeared or whatever. So they didn't have too much leadership. And anyway, the two major provinces which had generated the revolutionaries were had been partitioned, so there was chaos. So the revolutionaries weren't in a position to um, push back against the Nehruvians. Even within the Congress, you have other branches of the Congress. For example, the uh, Rajaji's right. branch and so on. They're also pushed aside. So the Nehruvians come to power, but they need allies. Hmm. So who do they find as allies? They basically grab on to the old collaborationist class of the upper middle class who had essentially, uh, uh, you know, helped the British colonize India. Um, so these were the contractors. Uh, they were the police officials of the Imperial Police Service um, uh, and so on. Mm. Now, what happens is that this collaborationist class actually is the biggest beneficiary of independence. So what happens is the British leave and these guys all get promoted up. Mm. Mm. Okay. So <laughs> the same person who was, you know, uh, uh, ordering um, uh, the troops to fire against the uh, freedom fighters uh, during their the, own people uh, and their own people are the same people who uh, a few years later after independence become the senior officials and are uh, now administering. administering the country. Now that is part of the administration, but in the intellectual space, this also happens because they were already in, in, in you know, they were the professors, writers, etc. Yeah. They were running the uh, uh, newspapers. So they suddenly all get promoted up. Mm -hmm. Now, this group has a pro had been, has a, uh, has a problem. Mm -hmm. They have to justify themselves in multiple ways. So first of all, it is very important to them that India does not exist before 1947. Because they know that if, if you... If India had existed from the beginning of time till now, then they were traitors before 1947. So in their heads, they are subtly introducing this idea that India doesn't introduce, it doesn't exist before 1947. It's more important to them yeah. than you can think because they are aware of their own treachery. Hmm. Secondly, you have to understand their own intellectual history. Before independence, what were they doing? They were trying to prove themselves to, to be... Uh, in some ways, causing up to the mm. British in multiple ways. So they were they were the people who were, for example, uh, very keen on proving themselves that we are also Aryans. Ah. Ah, okay. Right. So therefore, they were investing in all these strange racial theories. Mm. Mm, we are the descendants of the Aryans. Yes, we are a little brown, but you know, we are your guys only. Ah, you right. see, so therefore, all these Mahalanobis racial theories comes from this thinking. thinking. Now, I'm not saying everybody is into it. Um, but there is this underlying strain that is there. Right. Ah, and by the way, Pakistan even today suffers this in, in, in a somewhat different way. Right. You know, the bulk of Pakistanis are from, always been from where they are. And yet their elite are people who will always claim that, you know, our forefathers came as invaders from Central Asia. Right. So a version of it, this exists there as well. To maintain that dominance. Ah, so we are naturally the rulers of this place. Ah. You see? That is the, so this is why all these narratives that you hear that get, you will, you know, wonder why after independence are we still maintaining this? Uh. Because this is their history. The collaborationist class mm. is very keen to perpetuate this rather colonial view of Indian history because it is convenient to them. Right, right. And probably that also plays out in the modern times. I mean, uh, writing an article in an international newspaper or publishing a book which suits a certain narrative globally will obviously get them more global traction. Yes, because this collaborationist class has always been like this. Ah, ah, and again, cozying up to their yes. uh, Western colleagues. Yes, because that has been their uh, system of operation for a very long time. Right. And not only did they benefit in pre uh, in in uh, pre independence times right. even post independence this this pattern had continued continues i mean if you go and look back at who is the persons who are advising um, uh, nehru hmm. to uh, when in 1947-48 in the you know the kashmir war who are the people who advise him wrongly go to the uh, un under the wrong chapter mm. Mm. No. Right. why does he do that uh, you can blame nehru of course right. but who are the people who are advising him 
right who are they are the same people who are by the way uh, find that they are finding it difficult to compete in an open modernized uh, india so they are the same people who advocate bank nationalization mm. okay right. they are the same people go for license permit raj what are they doing closing they, up the they system they are closing up the system so they control it right right they are the same people who um, you know nationalize um, uh, the insurance system in the 1950s and carry out the first big uh, scandal the mundra scandal right so it's the same people who are repeatedly doing the same things what are they doing they're perpetuating their own control right uh switching back a little earlier uh, talking of governance based on historical accounts that you have seen so far uh, and you've also spoken about the need for administrative reforms in india mm-hmm. do you think uh, or would you like to share any traditional or indigenous models of governance that might have existed which you think can have practical applications as we possibly look at some sort of administrative reforms in india see india has a very long tradition of thinking about governance mm. going back you know even to the the epics and so on now it's not like it's a it's a static thing there are different schools of thought these different schools of thought disagreed with each other mm. and you find them popping up for example between the ramayana and the mahabharat the ramayana for example is a strong advocate of a application of the word of law or a contract uh, so the ramayan can be read um as basically ram continuously applying the laws to himself or a promise to himself even when it hurts him hmm. 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 pran jai par bachana na jai right right that is the conception of governance so how do you st- so without this what happens matsya nyaya the law of the fish where the big fish eat the small fish hmm. so ram has this very severe view so obviously the ramayan may have been originally a very simple story of love and adventure and so on but certainly later on it begins to make this case of governance of imposition of law that the promise or contract has to be imposed irrespective and so ram rajya is a place essentially where the king applies the laws to himself yeah. and so in ram rajya the the country the, the 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 kingdom of ayodhya is prosperous yeah. but ram himself lives in utter misery pining for his wife wife sita right he doesn't remarry he pines for her and yet he applies the law to himself so ram rajya is not utopia right. it's a place where the rulers apply the laws to themselves right. okay right now the mahabharat has a different view and in a sense it's a, it's the opposite view in the mahabharat you have yudhishthir who does the same thing he applies the laws all the time to himself but in fact it leads to bad outcomes yeah. ultimately it culminates in in a massive battle of the kurukshetra and in everything everything is destroyed yeah. and yet he's following all the laws yeah. right yes. so the mahabharat is making the opposite view that you see the word of the law is not enough you have to have the spirit of the law natural justice has a certain yeah. uh, role to play so what happens is in the mahabharat you continuously see krishna who is another avatar of the same god vishnu right who is continuously twisting the law in order to serve a different purpose a, a, an idea of natural justice hmm. right the law says that you can you know you have lost the game of dice and you can strip draupadi in the hall hmm. yeah the, now she is your dasi so hmm. you can do what you want with her hmm. that allowed legally allowed but krish it does not say anything about the length of the sari <laughs> right right so consequently what does krishna do allows for the sari to be continuous it's it's an unending sari right. and therefore you can you, you cannot do it so what i'm trying to say is here there is a conception of natural justice hmm. which is not there in ramayan ramayan allows for unfair things to happen just because it's in the law yeah just because so, it's in the so so right now point. this debate exists to this day hmm. the d- debate between the natural justice and the word of the law is not a resolved debate even today in many many areas you will find this that this is unfair but this is in the rule ha. right you'll hear this all the time but you see it's not so simple because if if you just begin to take everything as contextual and according to what is considered then everything will break down because you need the laws otherwise everybody will say in every single case you'll have to decide who is right and who is wrong so therefore so this debate is not an easy debate to be had in a and this debate was there even then 
And later on, you begin to see this. There are different schools of thought. Mm. So you have, for example, the school of Shukra. Shukra is the school where it says the legal system and laws and the imposition of laws is the way in which Matsya Nyaya is held. Okay. And then you have the school of Brihaspati. It says, yes, laws are important, but you also need economic policy. You need various kinds of other policies and mm. interventions. So that's the school of Brihaspati. Okay. Then there is the school of Kautilya. He says, no, no, both of these are important and you also need to take into account intellectual and cultural context. Mm. Uh, so there are all these schools of thought, Dandaniti, Varta, Anvikshiki, uh, Trai. And then, uh, then you have debates within these groups. Yeah. And then later on, you have people like Kamandak who come during the Gupta Empire, okay. who then also comes up with certain interventions and ideas. So you can see these ideas are evolving there are continuous debates. People are not agreeing on these things. Yes. But what I'm trying to do is, going back to your first question, is there an Indian mm. tradition of thinking about governance? Yes, there is. Mm. Can we derive something interesting from these debates? Absolutely. Now, I'm not saying that you have to go and you know take a 3rd century BC solution to the problem. Right. Obviously, you know, uh, Cortilia has traffic rules also in the Arsha Shastra. Right? So now traffic rules for buffaloes is not what you want to, traffic rules for bullock carts is not what you want to apply today. Mm. But the principles can still be uh, applied. Um, so uh, for example, if, uh, if you had Cortilia coming today huh. and you asked him, what are the big reforms you want to do? Yeah. Well, first of all, Cortilia uh, would have said, you know, imposition of justice and contracts, enforcement of contracts mm. is absolutely critical, right? That was the first thing you would say, but the role of the state, most important thing is administration of justice mm. and en enforcement of contracts. Having a judicial system with 40 million cases in it is absurd. So if Cotillia had been around today, the first thing he would invest in is actually in a judicial system and reforming the legal process. Right. So I'm just giving you yeah. examples how the principles of ancient India can be applied today, even if the specifics may be different. Of course, that, that context will change. Um, switching to education, um, we've spoken about history. Your uh, recent article on AI um, and how AI can almost scale up uh, and probably make undergrad education free uh, in the country. How do you conceptualize such a reality? Well, it's going to happen whether we like it or not. Now, the question is, do we emb embrace this? Hmm. Now, what I'm going to talk about is specific to university undergraduate education. There are, you know, we can have different uh, conversations about other parts of the education system. But this is, in my view, a sweet spot where the student is old enough to be able to navigate uh, a digitally based system on his or her own uh, steam. Okay. Uh, and this, it is also an area where the knowledge is largely systematized, unlike, say, at the PhD level where, or even master's level, where the knowledge is evolving and not yet right. uh, The evidence is still generating. Yeah. Yeah. So undergraduate education is interesting because the student is 18, 19, 20 years old, uh, presumably is able to understand the dynamics of self-education in a sense. And then you can allow then this person being educated in a completely different way. So today's college education is about um, the same lecture being given by thousands of uh, professors every year mm. uh, over and over again. Now, it's not only just boring, uh, it's also pointless. Yeah. You can give get the best guy to give that one lecture once and put it on YouTube. Let everybody watch it. Right. And you'll say, oh, what about, about Q&A? Well, chat GPT can do this. Right, because it's standardized knowledge. This is not about non-standardized knowledge. In standardized knowledge, chat GPT already today can do it. Mm. Right, and then they, everybody is used to using Zoom and other things. So you then allow for um, interaction in various ways, class participation, interaction. You can do Zoom. Now, there may not be uh, a, a solution to every area of... I mean, I can see medicine or surgery, you'll probably still have to do it the old way. more applied, yeah. But there are large areas of knowledge, the bulk of it, which you can do this way. Hmm. And even in areas where you do need some face-to-face -face interaction or a lab, for example, well, you can do all of most of the stuff hmm. or digitally. And then you can have, let's, let's say, for example, three months of the year, 
the class turns up each batch turns up in iit and as three months of living together working together interacting whatever uh, uses the labs etc and goes away mm. and it does it for four years three months each year mm. now look what happens as a result the same campus can be used three months three times so four batches can be pushed through the same campus system right 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 and this is for things where you need people now in something like you know a lot of areas like um, economics you bulk of it can be just taught digitally. entirely digitally right 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 so now what happens is we don't need to keep building these expensive campuses that's where the expense is right the brick and mortar the brick and mortar right. i do not need so much faculty being wasted in giving lectures ah. right right the, the existing faculty can be told you go and do uh, the cutting edge research mm. and once now uh, this undergraduate education can essentially be free because i it's costless i don't need large expensive campuses yeah. i don't need so many lecturers uh, i need a testing system of some sort but that testing system once created is infinitely scalable right right but and and probably it also answers the quality question right yes. as you said the best professor can give you that lecture on yes. say botany no i'm not saying that this will eliminate everything huh. there'll still be some good colleges some people will still prefer to go to the campus fine yeah. but i can envisage an environment where there is a basic bachelor's course on various yeah. subjects um which can be delivered entirely or at least significantly uh through this method and because it's so much cheaper i'm sure the government of india can say that this is a basic course get a good university to give it yeah. out and say that look if you get enough credits under this system you get a degree mm. and now because it's no longer based on these batches and going there many people will be able to do it some especially poorer people mm. will be able to work and do this uh, some people will do it in 2 years some people will do it in 6 years how do i care i only care about did the, that level of knowledge get accumulated right some people may be very brilliant they may do five courses together huh. somebody may decide after 20 years they wanted to be a uh, accountant but in fact after 20 years they decide to be a uh, to be an economist uh, fair enough <laughs> right so, right right and it also gives you maybe say diversity of uh, you know experience it's flexible right. it's uh, once created it is infinitely scalable and it's not that expensive to create it in the first place right and now what happens is that you use these campuses for other things hmm. right first of all you can the existing campuses can be scaled up mm -hmm. in many cases you'll find that these campuses are no longer needed then you use it for other things for example uh, take the existing faculty ask them to write more papers get to the cutting edge of knowledge right or you can use them you know m to the extent that now you have freed up all these lecture theaters create more labs right create the things that you actually need social infrastructure of various kinds emphasize sports or you can uh, you know create startup hubs mm, you know do all kinds of other things right, right. you you know I, um, um, instead of using these this real estate for lectures lectures right uh, is india or should india also be thinking about a way to regulate ai i mean is that thinking already there or is it just like a mammoth which cannot be regulated so uh, let me say again let me put a complexity uh, theory hat on this yeah complexity theory is a great framework for this because here is a swirling mass of things that are happening very quickly and there are unintended consequences are one of the risks mm. uh, it's evolving very fast where exactly it will go is unknown so this is in some ways a good way of thinking about it what you do here is in these situations my view is look you will have to find some way of regulating it because i can we can see that bad outcomes may happen hmm. but at the same time very careful not to regulate it in so tightly that you don't allow the innovations the good innovations to happen hmm. the problem is ex ante i can neither tell what the good path is nor what the bad things are ah, right that right. can't that, be that, predicted and this is and this is not for india only every country in the world has done this now the europeans so let me give you an example of the kinds of uh, regulations others are coming up with the europeans for example have a very rigid way in which they're trying to do it maybe they'll succeed i don't know but their theirs is based on trying to create certain risk profiles hmm. okay now that is a as i said a very soviet or newtonian way of thinking about the world because it requires you to put certain amount of 
risk weightage on the various uses now i have no way exactly knowing which one of the, what is more risky and what is not yeah. what i can do however is imagine what very bad outcomes can be hmm. i don't know if they'll happen but i can imagine what they are so the way that you can regulate this is by doing the following hmm. just in the exact same way in which we dealt with covid create handrails and basically make our way into the darkness of uncertainty through iteration and feedback loops in other words the allow for the evolution to happen respond quickly mm. rather than try try and predict where this is going to go mm. and meanwhile create certain kinds of handrails for example i think we can create systems of uh, manual overrides on ai we can create glass uh, um, doors and glass uh, uh, walls between different usages so that they don't begin infecting uh, each other um we can we can uh, uh, so what i'm trying to say is think through what are the worst case things that could happen and create handrails against them and then allow this thing to evolve create a small agency not a one large institution mm. once a nimble agency which keeps track of all these things mm. and continuously regulates it as it evolves and gives feedback in terms of how yes. that adaptation happens but do not be. attempt to do what some people are trying to do mm. is to have these mm. grand ex ante rules huh. because they will fail right. in exactly the same way that five year plans failed or urban master planning fails with all these complicated codes they'll all fail and it comes back to your complexity theory of how things are ever evolving and adapting yes absolutely with various permutations and combinations um you spoke about covid now in hopefully almost a post covid uh, time that we're living in what did india get right in terms of its covid management so again um well i won't take the health part because i was more involved in the economic part right. so here again complexity theory right. what happens is the following we have a completely uncertain situation we are told by different experts go in in march april of 2020 a wide variety of things some people are making the claim that this is just another bad flu and you know people getting too excited and then you will remember there were also people say that half of humanity will die yeah now as a policy maker what on earth do you do about this and in that environment you have these lockdowns happening we don't know how long those lockdowns will last it's not that we who are do- managing this don't know that lockdowns are uh, extremely tough things for uh, economies we did it with our eyes open because of health reasons but we have we have no idea what the unintended consequences on the system are going to be mm. so we thought about this again as a complex adaptive system and rather than a static system that needed to be reinflated so those who are conversant with more common uses of economic terms we did not see this as a demand shock we saw it as a supply shock which is a fundamentally different way of thinking about things hmm. why does it make a difference so for example in the rest of the world what were they doing they were giving out stimulus checks try and revive the economy get pump cash, pump it, cash uh, cut more, you know interest rates to zero now our view is look it's there is no demand problem here at least in the first instance because people want to buy things yeah. they want to go to the market they want to go to the restaurant you're stopping them from doing this hmm. so this is not a demand problem and it's probably it is a supply problem yeah. Yeah. so giving them more stimulus checks means that you're using up your ammunition hmm. without any outcome it's like you got your foot on the brake and you're pressing the accelerator away what will happen the engine will overheat right, right? and not something i'm saying exposed at that time i i was explaining this on television everywhere i've written articles written at that time the economic survey mentions this so this point was we were telling the rest of the world guys you got to have a, this massive inflation spike because you do it and you got it as well right so instead what were we doing again same idea first of all create handrails mm. because things may go really bad what are the handrails for well the very very poor mm. right for them this is a shock suddenly you don't have any income right so you have to provide them with a safety net hmm. this is a safety net idea it's not a reflation idea hmm. so what you do is in the safety net you provide 800 million people with food hmm. so that nobody should starve small amounts of money are transferred to the very poor through the jandhan account system not meant to revive the economy this is just to make sure everybody gets a safety net 
exact same idea we are doing with the economy the on the uh, all the small businesses etc we provide them with guarantees remember not stimulus checks hmm. what are we trying to avoid we are trying to avoid a cascade of defaults in the system the worst outcomes yeah yeah and also cascade cascading effects of these uh. so what happen i can't pay you you can't pay him he can't pay me we all go bust okay. so i don't want this cascade of default to happen hmm. so what do i do i i guarantee the payment i hold the insolvency and bankruptcy code in abeyance hmm. right and i do do some amount of cutting of uh, uh, interest rates and provide liquidity to the system so i have the so but again notice this is a safety net idea hmm. and then as we came out we became more confident of what this is and the lockdowns were unbound and despite the delta wave we didn't go into another lockdown this is when you've opened up the system i e have taken the foot off the brake hmm. then you press the accelerator somewhat so then we began to spend money but again we did it in a peculiar way we went and spent on infrastructure the massive roll out of infrastructure happens why did we go for infrastructure as opposed to give out stimulus checks well very simple reason hmm. we are aware that we are building up debt to do this and so if we are going to leave the next generation with a bunch of debt we need to leave them a bunch of assets as well so we are building these assets out and as it happens to be the multiplier effect of infrastructure build out is much higher than any other kind of spending so yes we do uh, spend money but we do it through building infrastructure right you spoke about debt uh, how does the macro economic stability of india in the current times compare to other countries because i mean we know that so many countries are reeling under inflation there's war food security crisis how do you think india is faring right now as far as given how the other economies have sort of turned out to be based on decisions they might have taken during covid the point is because we did not overextend ourselves on the macro front uh, we did get some increase in inflation but it was you know it barely went outside the uh, 2 to 6% range and then has come back to the middle rung of 4% yes you get every year some spikes in tomato prices etc that's a matter of local management mm. but by and large the overall macro situation the covid spike the energy price spike all of these were by and large we managed to manage uh, 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 go through reasonably well uh, the banking system very importantly came back uh, and is looking actually healthier than it did 4 or 5 years ago hmm. uh, whereas in many other countries it's got very severely impaired as you may know for example in america very hmm. severely impaired or in europe for that matter and um, we didn't have what in many emerging markets uh, you know a real breakdown of macro stability uh, which happened for example in turkey or Argentina or Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and so on, uh, Egypt. So we came out of this actually reasonably strong, and um, you know we are growing at about seven percent. Last year we grew by seven point two. My sense is that if oil prices don't spike up again, we will do something close to seven percent year again. Um, so our economy is growing reasonably strongly. Um, arguably, uh, the, the, the fastest growing major economy in the world. There are smaller economies that are going growing at a similar rate. um and what happens is that in that context um we are generating jobs and uh, uh, most importantly we are generating momentum and when we say that we are going to become go from fifth largest economy to fourth largest then to third largest the game is all about compounding growth okay, okay? don't try and grow very fast in any particular year there's no need hmm you know it's like when you're driving a car and you know we are in rough waters we're still coming out of covid there are all these shocks in the world uh, oil prices have come off now but they had gone up very sharply there's still a war uh, the world may be sinking into another recession for all we know uh, certainly global trade is very sharply shrinking uh, and in that environment you don't want to suddenly try and grow at 9% mm. right because what will happen is that suddenly domestic demand will blow up our imports will get sucked in and you won't be able to export to the rest of the world so in this context 7% gdp growth rate is a very very good rate it is significantly faster than the world uh, gdp and then good times will come at some point and at that time you accelerate it further grow at 8 9% in those times but just compounding this away mm. year after year after year mm. this is what the game is about right we spoke about uh, say the immediate past which is say in the time frame of 2 to 3 years but say in the past 10 years if you could tell us say big five economic wins for the country that you think 
will fundamentally have already altered or will alter the economic trajectory that the country is taking so it's important to understand what prime minister modi was attempting to do in this last 9 years uh, in the context of the longer history so in 1991 when we went down this path we basically had inherited a uh, dysfunctional economy which had been heavily damaged by the license permit socialist era we had an economic crisis the soviet union collapsed and so we were forced to do reforms mm. but the reforms of that time when we said reform and we said liberalization we meant the same thing mm. basically reforms was opening up uh, various sectors and withdrawing the indian state from the things it should not do and letting the markets function right now when the markets began functioning obviously markets don't function in vacuum unlike what you know laissez faire economists may try markets function in certain regulated context so markets suddenly happen also the the problems of unregulated markets very often came harshad mehta scam being one of them right. so in the 90s you saw opening up of markets and very quickly thereafter the need for regulatory uh, various kind of regulatory body so by the late 90s you begin to see great strengthening of these regulatory bodies sebi for example had existed already from 89 but it's really in the late 90s it's given teeth mm. other agencies also come regulating various other things telecom uh, you know the uh, competition commission and so on then by around 2000 you begin to notice that our creaking infrastructure is becoming the 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 the, the problem so then during the vajpay years you begin to see finally serious thought on creating world class infrastructure very early days but it's really in the 2000s that they we begin getting serious about creating the basic infrastructure. basic infrastructure uh going so you turn up in around 2014 mm. you have some infrastructure getting built you have the markets opened and some regulation be there mm. but the f- overall framework of the economy is still the archaic framework so now you need to build frameworks for the functioning of the economy so what are these frameworks first framework is the framework for um macro stability so therefore you see the introduction of the inflation targeting framework mm. then you need a framework for creative destruction or for innovation so introduction of the insolvency and bankruptcy code and the cleaning up of the of the of the banks hmm. you need a common market right so the, you introduce the gst G, what is gst gst is a free trade agreement that india signs with itself hmm. yes right you need a framework for safety nets hence the jam trinity right and so we have been building these frameworks so far most of those frameworks have not got done mm. and some of the leftover things from the previous rounds of reforms are also getting done so for example you saw the privatization of air india and some of those so that's also part of the liberalization era of mm. reform you are also seeing um, some of these sectors like drones uh, space geospatial sector those also get opened up so those are leftovers from that liberalization the era. tail end of that yeah, lib- tail of them and are getting done and now the framework have also got done mm. and now the infrastructure of course that's a continuous thing but there's this big boost in infrastructure that get done now you need to do somewhat newer things mm. and for so now what we are beginning to do are the really the painful bells and whistles and uh, details that you have to do these are called process reforms okay okay these are not structural reforms these that create these frameworks mm. these are process reforms you know you go into a sector and tighten it or loosen the uh but uh, the the knobs somewhere some some wiring has to be improved it's really the painful stuff you know get the patenting system to patent faster uh, uh clean up the way the uh, legal metrology act functions this is the laws on weights measures and labels okay huge source of harassment of small business mm. this has to be cleaned up so you have the you know uh, uh you have the uh you know uh, this attempt to decriminalize all these laws uh, and so on and so forth so these are the laws that we are now cleaning up right. and the process laws and then in the ve- in looking forward you will then have uh, other kinds of uh, uh, big reforms that need to be done to an aam aadmi hmm. who does not have background in economics what does modinomics really mean or how has it played out in the country so modinomics as i said relates to what i just told you modi economics is about creating an economy that is based on continuous innovation and entrepreneurship hmm. 
That's where the value generation happens. It means about having world-class infrastructure in which this innovation, et cetera, happen. And infrastructure, I don't mean just the physical infrastructure, but the architecture of rules, regulations, and other things, the, the, the soft infrastructure as well. Uh, and thirdly, creating safety nets so that if you have an, this sort of churning kind of economy with everybody's taking risks, obviously some part of people will go wrong. So you have a system uh, in which you have both the, the li liquidation of mistakes that happen, which is the insolvency and bankruptcy part, but also those who fall off this are continuously some safety net to provide them and in fact allow them, push them up over time to go. Now, notice this is not the Western idea of inequality. Mm -hmm. This is an idea of antyodaya, which means it's an idea of helping the absolutely poor. Mm, the last not thing. relatively poor, the absolutely poor. Right. So help the absolutely poor through direct intervention, through providing them gas, uh, providing them uh, direct money into their bank accounts, or uh, help them with... Uh, uh, building toilets or homes or water. So this is not a, a relative poverty idea. Mm. This is providing some safety net by which each individual can at least has some level to which they can come from, which they can then begin to do their own innovations, etc. Right. To give them a level playing field. Yeah. yeah. Right. It won't be level, but at least at a basic level, uh, f f playing field from which they can, you know, then individual potential they can, can explore. Can be realized. Mm. Uh, Talking about the future, um, there's a narrative around how, you know, it's India's decade. And then, of course, India at 2047. We hear about Amrit Kal as well. Um, what does India's economy and its future look like? And if you can give us some data points on where do we see the Indian economy going in the next 10 years or probably say when India's 100 years old at 2047? Well, I'll give the caveat here that it's... You know, the further you look into the future, the more difficult it is to predict exactly how things will be. Yeah. But I do hope that not just this, but future uh, generations of policymakers hmm. will be uh, flexible enough and adaptive enough to the challenges as they come rather than have fixed views of things. Hmm. Having given this caveat, let me say that we have now cl climbed to becoming the fifth largest economy in the world. We will be in not too distant future, the fourth largest economy when we go past Germany mm -hmm. and then go past Japan quickly thereafter because Japan's economy is only slightly bigger than, um, that than Germany. Germany. So by the time we are about a $5 trillion economy by, I don't know, 27, 28, uh, we will have become the world's third largest economy. Now, do remember that the next level of first two are very far away, but this will be still a uh, a good thing. So we will be five trillion dollars and a little bit more by the end of this decade, uh, six seven trillion, uh, world's third largest economy, and uh, you know, uh, still far away from 18, 19 trillion of where China is and twenty six trillion of where US is. In fact, they'll be bigger by that time. So, nonetheless, we will be a very major player in the world. We need to, however, keep maintaining that hmm. through to, nine, to 2047 because we have, of course, the demographic dividend hmm. that we can take advantage of in a world where everybody else is, aging, out, is aging rapidly. We have a demographic advantage that we need to be able to take advantage of. This, of course, does not is not a God-given right. So we do need to do uh, keep doing uh, reforms. So we will keep having to do innovate. And we will have to keep doing things. Now, in this context, there are some major uh, reforms that we need to do in the next generation of reform. So I talked about all the things we have done, yeah. uh, you know, frameworks, process reforms, all this stuff that I was talking about. But then the next generation of reforms is about doing things which are somewhat different. So remember, what is the last few generations of the reform? Law? They were firstly about withdrawing the Indian state from the things it should not do. And then creating the frameworks for which in which the markets can function themselves. Mm. Now, the next generation of reforms is for getting the Indian state to do the things it should be doing. Okay. All right. Okay. So what is the Indian state supposed to do? Supposed to do? Well, as I told you, I was telling you about Cortelia. Well, the administration of justice and enforcement of contracts has got to be one of them. Mm. So we cannot escape from getting our legal system from working. And, I, and this cannot be done by just the government, that this has to be done 
together with the legal fraternity, with the judicial system, uh, the wider legal fraternity, the police, because policing reform is an important part of this. So this whole entire gamut of things mm. about uh, you know delivery of justice and enforcement of contracts mm. has to be thought about. This won't happen in a shot. This will require a couple of de decades of work. Right. But you've got to start somewhere. Hmm. So I, I give that as a very major area of reform. Right. The second big area of reform is administrative reform. Hmm. So we inherited at independence a colonial uh, uh, bureaucracy. Hmm. The colonial bureaucracy was designed to essentially enforce control. It was not de designed to deliver services. Hmm. Right. Now, unfortunately, after independence, we went for this planned socialist pattern of uh, uh, economic management. What that did was, it. by the way, that logic seeped in, as I showed you, even into things like urban planning and everything. Right. And that line actually, rather than weaken the control mechanism of the colonial administration, actually strengthened it. So the socialist era strengthened this mm. controlling nature of our bureaucracy. Right. Now, after 1991, what we did is we did not reform the bureaucracy. Mm. Instead, we reduced its ability to interfere in the economy. Mm. But it's still the unreformed bureaucracy. The same bureaucracy is just it isn't allowed to get in your way as much as it did before. And all the growth and progress we have made is by restraining this guy. Mm. But the same machinery is still there. Mm. We now need to begin to reform this machinery to begin to get to do the things it should do. And so let me give you an example of the kinds of things it should do. Surely, uh, one of the things the bureaucracy and the state in general should be municipal services, mm -hmm. right? Now, these municipal services or even district administration, that is one of the most important places where the interaction of the citizen happens with the government. Right. And yet, who is it that delivers it? Take, for example, the district magistrate, one of the most important people in the lives of the majority of Indians the or the collector. municipal, uh, the collector, the municipal commissioner, yeah. right? In the bureaucracy, however, is the most junior most guy. Mm. Who's posted at? Yeah, he's a 33 year old um, uh, uh, inexperienced person who is there for 18 months. This is the one place where no attention is given. So you, it's not the fault of the DM. Mm. The DM is given too much to do at too early without the tools to do it. So don't complain that the DM, it's not about the individual ability of the DM hmm. or the municipal commissioner. He or she just doesn't have a chance because of the way the system is set up. Right. The D district magistrate should be a 40 year old person with significant length of service. Hmm. That person actually will then have an ability to demand things from the system. The poor 33-year-old doesn't even know how to call up at in, in the state capital. Uh -huh. He's afraid to call them even. Yeah. Instead, you have got the experienced guy sitting as some obscure secretary, something or the other, in the state capital twiddling their thumbs. Right. Why? That, that imbalance. Yeah. And then they're there for 18 months. Why? Let them there for three years. Let them be there. Let them administer. Let them understand how the state functions. And then you see when you have properly empowered the place where the state needs to be, mm. then the state will deliver those goods. Right. Why do you want this, uh, the, the senior most person to be in those areas where the state has no role? Right. Right. Finally, uh, a question for, um, say, Indian economists. What are some, say, areas of inquiry that you think Indian economists should focus their attention to, given, given the needs of the country? I think what we need to do is to really begin to look at uh, economics not as a siloed field, where economics is all about finding some random data set, putting it on some chart, doing running some regression on it, hmm. and then, you know... Uh, and then making grand claims about the world based on some obscure data set. Mm. Way too much of Indian, uh, uh, and this is not just true Indian, to be fair, it's also true worldwide, has become about doing random regression analysis on some obscure data set. It is totally useless, mm. not replicable, mm. and has no uh, ability to inform policy. Economics has got to have a much more freewheeling, wider view of what the field of economics should be. And so I think there is a, and particularly true in India, mm. there needs to be an exploration of economics in, you know, 
there are entire fields of economics that are not explored in india like urban economics mm. field that is almost non existent there are hardly any urban economists in this country except in some very limited uh, applications uh, similarly we don't have top quality transport economist uh, or uh, you know there are entire fields of economics which are not explored in india secondly we need to have wider views of how these things interact as i said complexity theory the whole point about complexity theory is these things none of these things function in silos mm. you need to have in the interconnections between these various fields is the game not these rigid regressions yeah right right that that brings us back to how we started about the complexity theory um my final question what's this uh, ship that you're designing what's the kentucky expedition uh, tell us more about it <laughs> okay so this is a, a somewhat madcap idea of mine that uh, i had been pursuing for a year but uh, years uh-huh. and then um, it's you know b- b- created its own momentum which is that um, you know i talked for years about the fact that indians used to build these ships from ancient times using a peculiar technology called stitching stitch ships okay now this technology has over time largely died out we still build some coastal boats etc using this ancient stitch technology but by and large has died out and for generations we haven't built really big ships yeah. using this so what i did is i found that there were descriptions of and even paintings sculpture etc of these stitch ships and i said why can't we build one of them uh, using this ancient ancient technology hmm. which there's still a few people who know how to do this this stitching right. technique that would... and build build ships that way right so we decided that we will try and build a ship with a design that goes back to the 4th 5th century ad wow uh, there's a painting of this kind of ship in ajanta by the way hmm. so we're using that as a prototype but it's it's an artistic uh, rep- uh, expression. Uh, expression so we will ha- we we are using other sources as well huh. and testing them as well and the idea is then to build a ship like this and so uh, with the help of uh, uh, the culture ministry uh, and the navy uh, we are now beginning to design such a ship and will sh- shortly begin building it uh, uh, in goa uh, in a shipyard there Uh, with a team from uh, kerala mm. who uh, have some experience building these kinds of uh, ships they, uh, they 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 built a arab version f- uh, of a 16th century ship using the stitch technique for the omanis so they have some experience uh, we are building a somewhat much older uh, you know a 16 year uh, 1600 year old design so significantly older design um, but nonetheless at least they'll have some experience so the idea is that we build the ship and uh, in the kartik purnima of 2025 to recreate one of these ships we will do a voyage with this stitch ship uh, from odisha mm. all the way to the island of bali in indonesia uh, this recreates the the voyages that in ancient times used to happen uh, there is still a festival in odisha called the bali jatra which literally means the voyage to bali ah. uh, to which uh, remember sort of remembers that in ancient times these voyages used to happen and even today uh, men uh, 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 women and children uh, get up on kartik purnima day and they put these small paper boats in in uh, water bodies to commemorate these voyages so we on this day we will try and do this voyage wow that that's super exciting and again it all brings us back to maritime history and all of that that we spoke about so thank you so much thank you uh, what's next um, are you writing do you get time to write well in due course i have got a bunch of books in my head but uh, you know i have limited time so uh, right Yeah. Great. We look forward to reading you and listening to you and I hope this episode has been as informative and inspiring for me as for all the other audiences who have been watching us. And that concludes a very fascinating conversation that almost felt like a journey through a modern day library. Hope you had a chance to do a crash course on the complexity theory and how history, economics, planning, technology are all interlinked and impact each other and pave the way for what's evolving to be India's decade. So stay tuned for these conversations. sessions and if you're not a fan of the long form check out our reels and shorts for quick knowledge bites from this podcast on our channel the new india junction